Today's case is a doctor who has taken a digital impression uh, with his lava COS scanner and would like a Bruxer uh, solid full contour zirconia bridge from teeth number 29 to 31. And uh, the doctor has the option to request the bridge in this, the model, I should say, in the software itself and has requested uh, a model for that, which we um, obviously want when we're making a bridge, a little different than a single unit where we still like to have um, a model to be able to work with. And so 3M has, as you can see, some partners that they trust to print their SLA models. These are, these are uh, laboratory partners that have been verified uh, as doing a, uh, a good job for them and they know that it's going to be accurate. And so this is what an SLA model looks like that you would receive um, from a 3M a trusted partner. And this is printed on a 3D printer. So unlike maybe the Knet model, if you've seen those they're kind of big and heavy models that are milled from polyurethane. These are printed um, on a 3D printer. So if you've seen the way that we fabricate Emacs crowns currently, we will use a 3D printer to print a full contour crown, invest it, burn it out, and then press Emacs into it. This is the way Serona makes their models through Infinident, the same way 3D printing. And if you use our ClearLock, product where we will send you um, essentially orthodontic retainers or Essex retainers. We'll send you three upper and three lower. And if the patient loses them or the dog eats them and you need three more, this is what we do. We take that stored uh, digital impression that you made or that we made from a stone model and then we'll print models like this and then thermoform uh, onto this and then send you the new um, send you the new appliances. So this is what a 3D printed model looks like and it comes with their articulator and, uh, and all in all works uh, very well. There's a different level of resolution in this uh, accuracy done on the prep side versus the opposing side just in terms of, of speed and efficiency, but uh, we're able to work with these models well. So it looks and feels a lot different than a traditional stone model, um, but we have noticed that the accuracy is very close if not to almost exactly the same because you don't get the same uh, type of shrinkage that you get from a polyvinyl impression and then subsequent expansion of a die stone when you print with 3D. So there's kind of fewer errors with this, but to a dentist like myself who grew up with stone models, these always kind of feel lightweight and never seem like you can really see detail quite as well as you can on a stone model. The interesting thing here though, is that when we took the doctor's digital impression, which we received in addition to the, the physical bridge that came in, we realized that there was uh, not enough room here uh, for this bridge, specifically on the most uh, distal abutment, so on this tooth right here. And when we measured it, we get, when we measure between the prep and the opposing tooth, 0.42 millimeters. And so more, most of the newer versions of intraoral scanners, including uh, 3M's newest uh, true definition will allow the doctor to see this in the office. So this doctor did not get an opportunity to see this, did not know that he did not have enough room for uh, Bruxer solid zirconia here, which is a minimum of 0.6 millimeters. And uh, as a result, sent this to us and paid to have uh, the model printed, even though we don't have enough room here. And when you can see this uh, amount of under reduction chair side while the patient's there and the patient's numb, this allows you to go back in and prep more on the tooth or prep on the opposing tooth if you wish and then grab another image right here and be able to see whether or not you've accomplished the adequate reduction because at this point we don't have enough room to actually do a Bruxer bridge. And if we look at the model and, and zoom in on this a little bit, you're going to see some issues we have. We have a very short distal wall. And so if you look at the, at the distal wall, and this is always very difficult to do um, because, and you can see how tapered it is, and it's, it's almost impossible with the size of the head of the handpiece to be able to get back there uh, and prep that distal wall well. It's, it's a very big challenge and almost impossible to do. Sometimes it's become of the t because of the tissue that's back here, but whenever you see an over tapered you know, distal wall like this one, it's because of the difficulty of getting the head of the handpiece and the burr back there. And, uh, and as a result, we have a very short over tapered non-retentive wall here. So it's going to be difficult for us to do a reduction coping. Theoretically, like for example, if we were short on space on the bicuspid, we could do a reduction coping for the doctor, make it on here and send it to him and have him adjust that prep. But to do it here, we're just going to blow out 
that whole distal wall. And so a reduction coping is really not going to work here. In an ideal world, this tooth would probably have uh, crown lengthening, yes, where a periodontist or the doctor would go in and remove some tissue, drop the bone down, so we could get a little more room. The farther the tip of the burr goes subgingerly, the more straight up and down we're gonna be able to hold that burr and get a better wall. This is an, essentially a non-retentive surface here. We're not getting any retention here on the distal of this lower second molar. The other way to create some more room here for a zirconia bridge would be to adjust the opposing, but you can see this crown, this second molar looks like it's already been adjusted and adjusted and then adjusted a little bit more compared to say the crown in front of it. So this appears to be something that's already been ground on a lot and maybe, maybe that happened during this prep or maybe it happened before, but it looks like we probably don't want to do much more adjustment on that crown. We could be wrong. We're going to have to call the doctor on this case, but really the two possible scenarios would be to do a little more reduction on this opposing tooth to get enough room, to perhaps have some crown lengthening done on this tooth to be able to reduce a little bit more but still have a somewhat retentive wall on the back, or to leave things as they are with our 0.42 millimeters of reduction here and switch this patient from a Bruxer bridge, which is not thick enough here. We'd have to go to cast metal here and a PFM bridge the rest of the way. So essentially it would be a PFM bridge with a metal occlusal or maybe an entire metal abutment on this most distal abutment. Uh, at this point, metal is the only thing that will be able to stand uh, that less than half a millimeter reduction. It certainly is not going to work uh, for solid zirconia, so it would have to be a PFM bridge. And actually, when you see how non-retentive this distal wall is on this tooth, getting zir a zirconia bridge to bond to this and stay in place might be difficult too. So you're actually probably better off with a PFM bridge here because you can bond uh, to that non-precious metal, the substructure of the bridge, much better than you could to the zirconia and get a, a higher bond strength. And so the PFM bridge may end up actually being the better idea in a case like this. But of course, the best case scenario of all would be the dentist's ability to be able to see this under reduction while the patient's still in the chair still anesthetized and be able to make an adjustment on the fly uh, before ordering the model and paying for the more model and sending it to the lab. Now, if the doctor chooses not to do that PFM bridge because the patient wants something tooth colored, uh, patient's gonna have to be brought back into the office, re-anesthetized, have some re-prepping done, maybe even some crown lengthening, and uh, it's just an extra appointment for the doctor that's basically gonna destroy any of the profitability associated with this three unit bridge. So the newer generations of digital scanners do allow you to see this before it goes out to your laboratory. And this is crucial because you can correct that at that first appointment and not have to have the patient back again, with the pa which the patient isn't thrilled with, and which, as I just mentioned, destroys most of the profitability associated with these cases.